Okay, well, as it's 7.30, I think we might begin. We've got 52 people here tonight, which is a terrific turnout. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to say a few welcome words to Dr. Lindsay Bleem, who is our guest speaker tonight. Uh, before I do that, let me just introduce myself. My name is Loretta O'Donnell. I'm the Vice Provost for Academic Affairs here at Nazarbayev University in the Sultan, the capital city of Kazakhstan. And I would very much like to say a thank you to the organizing committee, particularly all the members of the Energetic Cosmos Laboratory and to Yernazar in particular for coordinating these public lectures. I would like to thank you for inviting world renowned scholars who do have a reputation for clear communication skills to help us to understand scientific topics of broad interest and deep social impact. Now, let me introduce Dr. Lindsay Bleem, our guest speaker for this evening. She is definitely a big picture person. Since graduating with her PhD from the University of Chicago in 2013, and of course in her work as a physicist at the Argonne National Laboratory, Lindsay asks deeply challenging questions. Just as one example, as I think you know, her topic tonight is the origins and fate of the universe as observed from the bottom of the world. And for students in the audience tonight, I know that one of her messages will be that there are opportunities for students in this field. So please make sure you ask her questions that might be on your mind uh, using the Q&A component. Um, here at Nazarbayev University, we often say to our incoming students, when you're in your classroom, either in Zoom or in person, please don't hesitate to ask your professors who here are all research active. Ask your professors the question, how do you know what research questions to ask? Because knowing what questions to ask seems simple but can be deceptively complex. And if Dr. Bleem will give me a moment, I would like to quote from a 2013 blog created by MIT mathematician, Professor Peter Shaw. And this was a blog which was debating uh, with various scholars, the, the big question, which is often debated, does physics ask the question, what? Or does physics ask the question, how? And in this blog debate, one contributor wrote, well, physics is very much in the business of how. If you know a large enough body of what, you start to get an idea of how and why. Once you have a how, then you can have a what if. And if you correctly predict what if, then you have more confidence in your how. Now that seems a bit complex and another contributor summarized it by saying, well, the why questions tend to lead you down paths of inquiry that aren't answerable with science. So it's important to always be wary of how you ask a why question. But I would like to say that looking around the audience here tonight, it's deeply impressive that we have so many members of the local and the international community. Some of you are scientists, some are social scientists, some are researchers, some are students or teachers. And I know that some of you are philosophers and poets. But no matter what your background, I'm sure you're here tonight with an open mind. Whether you're here to seek answers to the question what, or the question how, or even the question why. So regardless of which question is top of mind for you as you listen to Dr. Lindsay Bleem explore the origins and fate of the universe as observed from the bottom of the world, I'm reminded of the words of a great British economist and philosopher, John Maynard Keynes, who wrote, when the facts change, I change my mind. What do you do? So I think we're all here tonight and we are prepared to change our minds as Dr. Bleem challenges us to frame and reframe some big questions. And some of the questions she asks are, does the accelerating expansion of the universe 
require a modification to our theories of gravity? Or does there exist some new form of energy, so-called dark energy? Dr. Bleem illuminates this problem by studying clusters of galaxies, the largest gravitationally bound systems in the universe. She's a member of the South Pole Telescope, Telescope Collaboration, and her research interests also include large scale structure, the cosmic microwave background, and the development of bolometric detectors for measurements of the millimeter wave sky. So Dr. Bleem, thank you so much for joining us here tonight. I'm sure we'll all enjoy this journey through space and time. And of course, to our audience, please, please be prepared to ask your questions, whether they're big questions or small questions, how questions, what questions, or even why questions. Dr. Bleem, over to you. Thanks very much for that wonderful introduction. And I'm delighted to be here this morning, this evening. Um, and thanks very much to the organizers for the opportunity to discuss my work um, and the work of my collaborators with you today. So humans across all time have asked those questions we just heard about, the how, the why, why are we here? What are we doing? What is our place in the cosmos? And to answer these questions, we've naturally always looked to the night sky, this sort of mysterious mythical uh, thing that surrounds us and that we use to provide clues to the cosmos, both our origins, but also very practical matters. Where are we in the world? How do I find where I'm going? What is going to be the, the path I should take to get to where I want to go? Um, and to do this, there's always been this really close coupling between technology and science, the technology enabling us to ask, uh, to answer these really important questions and really satisfying our curiosity and in fact, put, encouraging us to ask further questions. Now we've seen this, um, some of us in our own lifetime, um, with just this remarkable technology development in the optical wind. So we've gone from this era where in order to map the sky, we've had these pencil and paper, just these really precise drawings of the positions of stars and their motions that have given us a picture of where we are both in our solar system and the broader cosmos. But then the development of technology has really allowed us to revolutionize this picture. First from the development of photographs, which allowed us not to just depend on the records of our human eye and the fallibilities there, but moving on to the technological development in this last century of the, the charge couple device, which of course feeds our optical cameras, which really allows us to probe deeper and further into the universe. So this is just an example here of now the evolution going from those photographic plates um, to what we can actually see when we look at the same part of the sky with a CCD camera. So the invisible becoming visible. Now this progress driven by technology, of course we've focused on what we can see in the visible. This is where our focus really lies as humans. This is the sensitivity in the electromagnetic spectrum of the human eye, um, what we're most attuned to. So this is where most of the development first happens, where we can show here the wavelength of light, and then where we are sensitive to as humans. So this is what we can see. We can see about 1% of the light that lands on us, on our eyes. Photographic plates, while not particularly more efficient, um, you can leave that shutter open on your camera for a very long time. This allows us to probe much deeper and wider wavelengths and really makes us see the faint things we can never detect with our eyes. But the real improvement comes in this past century with this revolution in technology with CCDs, a factor of 100 more efficiency and more collecting efficiency, allowing us to probe further and further into the universe. Now, of course, the universe is not just restricted to this very narrow region in light that the human eyes are sensitive to. There's, of course, the entire what we call the electromagnetic spectrum where light is classified by its wavelength, um, which is also related to its temperature and energy. So when I talk about the electromagnetic spectrum, 
course, we have light at radio wavelengths, very long, lower energy wavelengths. Moving to uh, the infrared, which traces heat signatures. Visible light, of course, we're all familiar with. The UV light, which gives us sunburns. Um, and then higher and higher frequencies, tracing higher and higher energies, which fortunately for life on Earth can actually penetrate our atmosphere. So when we're doing astronomy, um, we're really leverage, we want to really leverage this entire picture, this entire electromagnetic spectrum, because each part of the spectrum really traces different physical aspects of the universe, allows us to probe different uh, physical laws and processes. And to do that, um, we have to move beyond the visible, what we can see, and use technology to probe what was previously unseen to give us a new picture of the universe. Because when we do that, we can find what's really at the heart of things. So this is an example of a beautiful image um, from NASA's Hubble Space Telescope of a region of sky called the Ego Nebula. Um, and if you just look in the optical, it's, it's really interesting. Um, but you see these pillars um, of gas, um, but they're hiding what's really the heart of the matter, what's unseen. Whereas if you look in the infrared, you see a rich diversity of stars, this new regions are exposed. And this is really the exciting part. These star nurseries, which are hidden in the optical, become seen when we look at new wavelengths and explore the universe in new ways. So how do we do this? What, what is the, the, how do astronomers approach this? So this is a movie now showing what we see when we look out into the night sky. So here we are in our uh, maybe a slightly special solar system, orbiting a tip, sort of typical star in a typical galaxy of the universe. Now, if we then go ahead and unpack the night sky, unpack this glow and look at it across the entire electromagnetic spectrum, we see something quite exciting. So we go from the stars we see in the galaxy um, all the way, let's show this again, we go from the stars we see and the dust clouds really at the heart of our galaxy. You can see in the visible wavelengths, which you will have seen if you've looked up at the night sky on a clear dark night, you can see this beautiful band of the Milky Way crossing the sky. But as we go to longer and longer wavelengths, we start to see new features. We really see a dust dominated sky, in the infrared moving to the far infrared submillimeter, and now we're at millimeter wavelengths or microwave wavelengths. And what we see is truly remarkable. This is an image of the microwave sky. Just take that in. It's, it's you, first glance, you think this is pretty boring. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at something and it, it's uniform intensity. It's the same color in this picture everywhere. Why is this exciting? Why was this one of the most profound discoveries of the last century? And the reason is this. This is saying something profound when you can say that the temperature of the sky at one location is exactly the same to very high precision to the temperature of the sky at another location. Why is it the same when we know these things can't possibly um, be in contact today? And the story of this um, really was recognized after these initial observations um, back in the 60s um, as the signature of the early Big Bang explosion at the beginning of the universe. This uniform afterglow, this glowing microwave sky is the relics radiation from the Big Bang explosion in the universe. This explosion happened everywhere and we can see that uniform intensity, that relic glow everywhere we look. So this is again, a story of technology enabling discovery. And there's a really wonderful story that goes behind this discovery of the cosmic microwave background, this uniform radiation over the whole sky in that coupling technology with science um, back in the sixties, um, we were just first developing our space satellite technology. And so we were not even using active receivers to communicate with satellites, um, meaning 
when we wanted to communicate over long distances, of course, we didn't have TV satellites or the other, the fantastic fiber communications we have over the ground. We were really just starting this revolution. And one of the early programs to do this involved launching just huge balloons. They used as mirrors and they would bounce the radio signals off the balloons passively from one part of the world to the other. Now you can imagine this is incredibly challenging, incredibly faint signals, need powerful transmitters and incredibly exquisitely sensitive receivers. This telescope here um, that was used to discover the cosmic microwave background was one of these such receivers. Now, when we improved our space technology in very few years, they said, eh, well, we'll let the scientists have this wonderful tool. We quickly repackaged it, repurposed it, and made these exquisite measurements of this really faint cosmic signal. Now, moving on, we know um, from all of our observations at other wavelengths that the universe cannot be so uniform. There, we see these beautiful galaxies. They had to come from somewhere. So really, the race was on. If this was the seeds of structure in the universe, the growing, glowing relic afterglow of the Big Bang, those seeds for the galaxies had to exist within it. There had to be some spatial variations within that uniform glow. Because that, that those first few seeds of the universe from the cosmic microwave background had to have time to grow under the influence of gravity into the galaxies and clusters we see today. Because when we look back in time, uh, we're looking, I'm sorry, when we look back in distant objects in the universe, we're really looking back in time. So the race was on. We launched a series of technology missions as the satellite technology improved, really looking for these small fluctuations, these temperature deviations in the cosmic microwave background that would be the seeds of structure growth of the first galaxies and clusters of galaxies in the universe. The first CMB satellite mission was actually launched um, by the Soviet Union in 1983. And while it couldn't detect these fluctuations, it was able to detect the relative motion of the Earth relative to this uniform glow. So the CMB dipole, as it's called. It took till the 90s with the fantastic COBE mission to actually detect these tiny fluctuations on the cosmic microwave background, these seeds of structure. This, of course, led to a second Nobel Prize that I'll mention in this talk um, by John Mather and George Smoot, um, where these one part in 100,000 tiny, tiny fluctuations grow under the influence of gravity into the galaxies and the massive structures we see in the universe today. Not only was the universe shown to be incredibly smooth, it was also shown to be a beautiful, very cold black body. Uh, the universe's most perfect black body, glowing with a uniform radiation of 2.73 Kelvin degrees above absolute zero. Another great triumph of the COBE mission. Following COBE, we had continual improvement, um, first with the WMAP satellite, and then with ESA's Planck, which has made the most recent all-sky map of the cosmic microwave background. So these tiny, tiny temperature deviations, one part in 100,000, have now been exquisitely mapped. These are the tiny, tiny quantum fluctuations that grow under the influence of gravity into the structure we see today. Now, what can we learn um, from this data? Well, you can see when you look at this image that it's not just uniform intensity, that the power as a function of scale actually varies quite a bit. Um, so if you think back to your stereo or your, your Photoshop tools, um, you know that when you have more power at large scales or low frequencies, you're, you're pumping up the bass. And if you were having a very high frequency power, um, you'd be the equivalent of audially pumping up the treble. So we can measure the relative amplitudes of the contributions to this image, this acoustic symphony, um, to measure what's called the power spectrum. And this is quite a complex measurement, um, but of what I want you to take away is from this measurement of the power spectrum as a function of angular scale. So this is very large scales, this is very small scales. These are the data points measured by the Planck experiment. These are the acoustic oscillations and the sound waves of the early universe. And by analyzing this acoustic symphony, 
we can gain incredible knowledge about our cosmological parameters models. Theorists can predict using our ideas of how the universe formed and evolved, um, how the component composition of the universe should affect this data. And what we see is that this data is gorgeously fit by just a cosmological model with just six free parameters. And today we know that cosmological model is really dominated by two components. One is dark energy, one is dark matter. And then finally, the third component, ordinary matter, which makes up you and me, is just a small fraction of the total composition of our universe. So we look at this and we say, wow, I know what the universe is made of. I have a model that works incredibly well. Where do we go from here? And the truth is, we're really just getting started. While that past three to four decades of study of the cosmic microwave background has really provided a tremendous underpinning for our models of cosmology, we have incredibly far to go. And while all of this work has been building up in the, the satellite technology, um, a parallel development has been underway um, for ground-based experiments. And the one I'm gonna tell you about today um, it's one I've worked on for the last 15 years, an experiment known as the South Pole Telescope. With me, um, the South Pole Telescope is a 10 meter, some millimeter quality telescope um, located about a kilometer from the geographic South Pole. So that's me in the, the red jacket there for scale. So an absolutely enormous facility um, located in Antarctica. We observe at three different frequencies, um, 150, 250, sorry, 100, 150, and 220 gigahertz, um, which is about three millimeters, uh, three, two, and one millimeter wavelength radiation. Um, one of the advantages of being on the ground um, is it enables continuous technology upgrades, so continuous upgrades of our system. Um, so we've actually had the good fortune to deploy three different experiments on this facility, um, which have really formed the bulk of our uh, cosmological analyses. Uh, the first deployed in 2007, the first one I worked on, SPTSC, um, followed by SPT Pole, and then our current um, workhorse, SPT3G. Now, of course, the work I'm showing you today is not just my own work, um, but it's really the very hard work of about 70 scientists, um, half our students and postdocs, really distributed across 20 institutions in the US and internationally. But one of the first questions I always get when I say I work at the South Pole, is why do you go to the South Pole? So when I started on SPT back in 2005, all I really knew about Antarctica was, well, you know, in the early 1900s, there were some, you know, dog races to, you know, get explorers to claim the South Pole. Um, and yes, Anderson and Scott, who the research base was named after, were the first uh, to arrive at the pole back in 1911. Um, but Antarctica is such more a valuable tool than for exploration. The food is not great. Uh, we certainly don't go for the food, uh, which is stored in these massive warehouses located on the ice, uh, where just like your cave system in the north um, is continually maintained at 12C. Um, when you're in a, under the ice in Antarctica, you have a nice stable refrigerator that's at minus 50 C. So at minus 40, the Fahrenheit and Celsius scales match up, which is very convenient for us Americans translating. Uh, we don't go for the vehicles, but they are pretty cool. This is the bus that picks you up when you first arrive in Antarctica. Um, plenty of snowmobiles, um, cool planes. Um, the South Pole is actually everything, at the South Pole has actually been constructed to run off of JP8 jet fuel. Um, which was originally siphoned off of these ski planes, which would come in and land at the South Pole runway. Um, now those are brought in by these massive fuel sledges in an annual traverse um, and stored in these massive tanks under the station. So everything is continually powered off of jet fuel um, year round. We don't go for the people, um, but the scientists and staff are lovely. Um, there's about 100 on site in the summer, 40 on site in the winter, and no COVID at the South Pole Station. Um, so you can really hang out with your friends when you're off hours, um, be the star quarterback, American quarterback on the continent. But we don't go for all these reasons. Uh, we go to the South Pole 
for the weather. So this is a picture now showing the, the ski way coming in for a landing um, with the South Pole main base on the left and the telescope or the dark sector on the right. So we go both for the, the, astrono the, the astronomical weather, but we also go for the human weather. There are no people around. Um, there's no radio interference. It is an incredibly quiet site for astronomy. But as far as the normal weather, it turns out that the South Pole is an incredibly wonderful place um, for allowing wavelengths of light at the cosmic microwave background frequencies through. So this is now returning to that picture I showed you earlier, um, but flipped, showing the transmission of the atmosphere again. So again, we can't fortunately receive on Earth things like gamma rays and X-rays. We have wonderful sensitivity to visible light, and hence we evolve with sensitivity um, in our eyes to that frequency range. Um, much of the longer wavelengths until you reach the radio wavelengths are absorbed by the atmosphere, but you can see around a few centimeters, um, there, is, there are some windows to, uh, through the atmosphere. And it turns out um, the South Pole has the perfect conditions to allow this atmosphere transparency. So on the top right, I'm showing you now the transmission of the atmosphere um, versus frequency for the three bands of the, the three observing frequencies, three colors we can observe with the South Pole Telescope with the typical amount of precipital water vapor in the atmosphere at the South Pole Telescope site. So what this means is that if you were to collapse all the water vapor in a column of atmosphere, um, you would get about a quarter of a millimeter of water vapor at the South Pole. The second best site on Earth, the Atacama, is a few millimeters on a typical day. Um, and then you go somewhere like Chicago or much of the world, and you're just completely swamped by this water. Um, great for human life, not good for astronomy. Because water, just like the water um, reacts in your microwave, um, absorbs um, light at the frequencies that we observe the cosmic microwave background at, um, and also emits um, so a great source of noise for ground-based cosmic microwave background experiments. Now, it's a great uh, fortune that when you look at the spectrum of the cosmic microwave background, that beautiful 2.73 Kelvin black body is measured by the COBE fire s experiment. What you see is the peak actually lies wonderfully within the atmospheric window. So we've really been given a gift by nature that allows us to go to these extreme sites and really get a good handle on measurements of the cosmic microwave background. Now we have this wonderful site. We've gone to all the trouble of breaking down this 320,000 kilogram telescope into little pieces that we've then flown in individually packaged bits in one of these LC-130s. So our entire telescope um, came in many, many, many flights of one of these planes um, to the South Pole where it was reassembled in three months during one um, summer season. So we have this wonderful telescope. It's completely customized for observations of the cosmic wave background. We have the site, we have the telescope. How have we customized the telescope? So several key features. So first of all, we're in Antarctica. Um, you don't want to expose your humans to cold weather. So in the summer, it ranges, um, when I was there, it ranged between about minus 60 and minus 10 uh, Celsius. It can, of course, get much colder in the winter. So it typically reaches around minus 100 Fahrenheit, that is. Um, and so you really want to protect your people <laughs> from this weather. So the telescope has some unique features. First of all, this is where the, the camera lives. So light comes in, it bounces off this 10 meter primary um, and into this receiver cryostat here. This cryostat and this lives in this cabin, which can then mate, um, the telescope will actually rotate down and allow the telescope to mate um, to the warm control room. So we can do all of our maintenance and all of our upgrades in the warmth, relative warmth and protection of the station. Now, if you're a cosmic microwave photon, what happens to you uh, when we go through the telescope? So first of all, the, the CMB light comes from the sky. It bounces off our 10 meter mirror, which we've aligned to a surface accuracy of 20 microns, roughly the thickness of a human hair. And then it bounces through um, this window um, into a vacuum sealed cryostat. So the cosmic microwave background, of course, is very, very cold. 
it's at 2.73 Kelvin. Um, we need to have receivers and an and instrumental setup that's sensitive enough to make precision measurements of this really incredibly faint signal. To do this, um, we use a, a technology um, which requires us to cool our detectors um, to really leverage the site characteristics, this, this really clear sky, um, and be sensitive to these faint signals. This requires a cryogenic uh, vacuum system. And so when the, the CMB photons come in, they go through this window and the out of band radiation, the stuff we don't want, which would heat up this cryostat is immediately blocked by custom filters. The light then bounces off a cold um, secondary mirror for SVTSC and ST pole, uh, a warm secondary for SVT3G for space regions. Um, through this and into what we call our receiver cryostat, or really the heart of our experiments. Here's a blow up of this system now for SPT3G. Um, and I should say that each one of these pieces is custom. While we're really leveraging a whole range of uh, really powerful technologies to build the system, um, we've coupled it together in ways that are tailored for CMB experiments. So we make use of really um, powerful coolers. So these are pulse tube coolers that can cool the entire cryostat to a few degrees Kelvin. Um, also used, for example, in industry or in, in uh, MRI machines. Um, but we, 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 we modified everything. We, we take what industry gives us and then we tweak it. Everything about this has been tweaked to optimize it to use in a cosmic migrate background experiment. So going through um, and landing, if our, now our photon is landing in this cryostat, um, what you can see is that again, we pass through these filters. We come to the coldest part of the cryostat, um, which is now at four Kelvin, uh, where our detectors live. So this is a photon passing through these custom lenslets, which focus the light um, onto these detector arrays. These detector arrays are manufactured using the same sort of technology that manufacture your computer chips um, with lithium, uh, sorry, lithographic processing techniques. We further zoom and each one of these detectors, um, I wish I could be there with you to show you these in size, but these arrays are about um, 10 centimeters across. And each one of these pixels is a few millimeters. Um, each one of these pixels is polarization sensitive. This is the antenna, which couples to our light. Um, which is then read out, um, the signals are then read out here with a bolometer, which I'll say a little bit more about in the next slide. And here's another picture of this focal plane for scale. So the SPT3G detectors are what we call bolometers. So this is what's really fun about working on a cosmic wave background experiment. Um, when you're doing this technology development, there's the arts and crafts of putting together your receiver, getting all the filters and, and the coupling right. Um, but then there's the, the technology and the detectors themselves, which really relies on quantum mechanics. So we're, we're using the whole spectrum of technology available to us. So what we're doing with our bolometers are conceptually quite simple. So when we're measuring the temperature of the millimeter wave sky, we have this incident radiation come in, it's coupled to an absorber, and then it's read out with a thermistor. So this is standard bolometer setup. The whole thing, the thing is linked um, to a thermal bath so it doesn't you know, run away with heat as it absorbs this radiation. Now our thermistor is where the magic happens. Um, for our thermistor, we use what's an incredibly sensitive thermometer um, where we bias our detectors into this special region between a normal metal um, this is the resistance here. So you can see it has a finite resistance in us. In our case, we use um, resistors, which are about an ohm. And of course, when, when a material goes superconducting, it has no resistance. Um, so its resistance is down here. Now there is this special region in superconductors um, you can bias your detectors at, which is this very, very steep transition between a normal metal and a superconductor. And so we can hook these up in an electrical circuit and bias them into this region. And now we have created a system which is incredibly sensitive to small changes in temperature. For example, um, we're scanning across the sky and now the sky power goes down a little. So the temperature drops a little, the, the resistance drops, um, but we've set up the circuit so that as the resistance drops, 
you get more current so that the system corrects for it, we read out that small change in current and we maintain our stable operation in this location. So we're highly sensitive and linear response to very small changes in the sky signal. This is this picture of the, the SBT at work. Um, so this is, um, for those of you who've done sort of intro physics lab, you might be familiar with hooking things up to your oscilloscope and, and reading out signals as you make things work. This is exactly what we're doing here. We, we've integrated the camera for the first time, and now we've got our fancy oscilloscope pulling up and we're just reading out the signals, the electronic signals from individual detectors as we scan the telescope across the sky. And so we're, we're scanning and then we hit this really bright millimeter wave source and whoop, there goes the sky signal. So the, the sky signal becomes very bright. Our current drops, which is exactly what you would expect um, for this bolometer based feedback. We go off the signal. Um, we have to give it more current to keep things stable. We scan again, on signal, off, on source, off. So this is, this is a telescope in action, the first light of SVT. Now, of course, um, everything is now automated. We're not reading individual detectors out with oscilloscopes. We have 16,000 of them that we have to read out. So now we're really operating in what we would call routine relentless observations. So this is a movie um, taken by one of our winter overs at the South Pole um, showing SVT in action. So one of the other advantages of the South Pole, besides the fact that we're this fantastic astronomical site um, with incredibly little water vapor, Antarctica is the world's largest desert. Um, great trivia question if you could ask. Um, is that our ability to just relentlessly observe the same patch of sky. So this is a movie now um, of quite a few days of operation. And you can see that here, the sky is just rotating overhead. Things don't, don't rise and set in Antarctica. So when, we, when we're observing the same patch of sky, it's at the same elevation, and we just scan back and forth and back and forth and back. And you can see the winter overs when you see these red lights down here. This is the winter overs walking back and forth, the kilometer to the station. They walk every day um, to check on our telescope and make things, sure things are going okay. Um, other features you would notice in these, um, of course, the Milky Way. Um, we're not sensitive um, to this aurora light. Um, this is not in the millimeter wave bands, but these are the beautiful southern lights, um, which I would love to see, but I don't want to spend the winter at the South Pole. Um, and then all of these little super fast moving streaks that you see moving across the sky. These are satellites um, going overhead. So here we are grinding away back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, doing a calibration and then going again. So the sun sets for six months in Antarctica. So we have this incredibly, incredibly stable observing season um, to acquire our CMD data within. So what does that data look like? Um, well, I showed you just a flavor of it from our first light. Um, this is now a small patch of data. So this is us scanning across the sky. Here, the temperature of the sky is a little colder, so the current went up a little more. Here, it's a little hotter. Um, and now this is a whole bunch of bolometers all scanning at the same time. In fact, this is six minutes of data from the SPT um, CMB field observation, showing about 40 of the 400 detectors at the time, um, 150 gigahertz for the original camera SPT SC. We've done a little bit of data processing on this data. Um, but then we can further process it um, to make the products we're interested in, which are our CMB maps. So sky signals, um, measuring the temperature, mainly measuring the atmosphere is what really pulls out your eye. That's why all the detectors are moving in common. Um, while we've gotten rid of most of the atmosphere, there is, fortunately for the humans, there's still a little left over. Um, filtering it, it looks much cleaner. Uh, then we know um, as we're scanning across the sky exactly where each detector was pointing um, at each time. So we can map that to an angular location on the sky, figure out where in the map we're making that data point corresponds to, um, apply absolute calibrations to each detector to go from these funny current units into some physical meaning units. 
um, combine all the data, um, waiting by each detector's noise. So some of our detectors are less well behaved to say than other. Um, so we want to downweight the noisy detectors, upweight the less noisy detectors, and then sum everything up. That's it. We do this over and over and over for months and months and months. So here's a single observation map of one of our fields, 20 observations, and a full co-ed. Now going back to that uh, original picture I showed you of the all sky data um, before, this is now highlighting what this ground-based data really brings for you. So this is a picture of now a tiny patch of square degrees, not 40,000 square degrees, but just a zoom in of 50 square degrees um, from the WMAP, NASA WMAP mission. Moving on to Planck, um, twice the angular resolution, seven times deeper than WMAP. Finally moving to SPT. So really exquisite resolution, um, this is what you can get with a 10 meter mirror, which you can't launch into space, um, and 17 times deeper. So we can just grind away at these patches of sky to reduce the noise in our observations. If we lightly filter these maps to pull up the sky signals, um, we see the same CMB anisotropies that you saw before, um, which are really giving us a picture of the baby universe. Um, but of course, you also see these very small scale features. Um, these bright sources are things like AGN, accretion disks around black holes, um, and the dust clouds around some of the most distant star-forming galaxies in the universe. Um, these have actually made it into the popular press. If you've ever seen the, the show The Big Bang Theory, um, SBT actually has a couple cameos in that survey. Finally, um, these shadows, these dark spots, which is a little surprising, um, on the cosmic background sky, um, these are actually known as clusters of galaxies. These are massive accumulations of matter and gas um, and, um, that have been gravitationally bound um, that weigh something like a million trillion times the mass of the sun. So 10 to the 14, 10 to the 15 times the mass of our sun, the largest collapsed objects in the universe. And these leave their imprints in the cosmic microwave background. And this really shows you um, why we wanna keep going. This really wealth of data that wasn't so visible in the previous surveys um, with this incredibly improved uh, angular precision and lower noise, um, the ground-based experiments are really bringing out how the history of the universe is imprinted on the entire cosmic wave background. So I won't have time to tell you about today. This is would be a whole two hour seminar in its own. Um, how the, the earliest moments from inflation are encoded in the, the CMB. Um, but as the CMB photon travels to us from the surface of last scattering from its emission points, it interacts with all of that matter along the line of sight, um, really tracing out the, the first stars, um, the earliest galaxies, and then these massive structures, these clusters of galaxies. So a couple of years ago, uh, Professor Blake Sherwin gave you a really nice talk um, on the gravitational lensing signatures um, that trace the paths of these deflected photons by the, the matter along the line of sight. So I'm not gonna talk about that today. Um, instead, in the final few minutes I have, I just wanted to highlight what I promised you in my talk. I'm not only gonna tell you about the beginning of the universe, but I'm gonna talk to tell you about how the CMB can tell us about the end. So let's look at these clusters of galaxies, these enormous, structures um, in the, the most enormous struct, gravitationally bound structures in the universe. These are really the culmination of those small, tiny fluctuations growing into the largest things in the universe over the age of the universe. And this is now a simulation showing how this takes place. So each one of these circles here um, today represents a cluster of galaxies. And as you go back in time, um, there are fewer and fewer of them because structure takes time to grow. We need time to grow from these initial seeds of structure traced by the cosmic microwave background into these massive clusters of galaxies today. Now, it turns out that the composition of the universe, um, no surprise, has an enormous impact on how many of these things, systems we see and how, uh, what time we see them at. So, if we compare a simulation now showing a comparison between a universe which is just matter, nothing called this mysterious dark energy stuff, um, and one that's much more like what we think we see today as um, constrained by the Planck survey and, and galaxy surveys, 
um, which is about 70% dark energy, mostly dark energy and 30% matter. Um, what we can see in a simulation tuned to match exactly what we see today. So the same distribution of clusters in the local universe. As we look back in time, we see a very different picture of how many clusters there are. Dark energy effectively is retarding the growth of clusters. And so in order for them to be the same number today, they had to start growing a lot earlier. This is a clear signature of dark energy um, in clusters of galaxies. Now you can parameterize all this up um, formally, I'm not gonna go through this, but the math is all there um, to just make predictions for a function of mass and the number of clusters you should see, what the differences is, are for a whole suite of cosmological models. Um, but in a nutshell, all we need for clusters um, with cosmology is to find them, to do this cosmic census, and then to relate their observable signatures to mass, um, because that's how we actually connect to our cosmological models. And the CMB turns out through this effect um, called the sinaiev zeldovich effect, um, which is inverse Compton scattering for the, uh, the CMB photons off the hot gas in these clusters for the physicists in the audience. Um, it turns out that this effect, this shadowing effect, allows us to detect these clusters independent of distance. So it's like if I wanted to detect all the light bulbs on my block and just count them up to see how many people lived on my block. Um, if I could see that light bulb that was right next to me just as easily as I could see it all the way at the end of the block. It's a fantastic thing for a counting experiment. I can detect these no matter where in the universe they are, no matter how far away um, because of the physics of this effect. So the CMB has really given us a powerful tool for identifying the most massive objects in the universe. So when we do this census, we've done this census now with the South Pole Telescope and other CMB surveys, um, what you can see is we can detect these systems through billions of years. Um, so this is now showing the look back time for each one of these dark spots we've detected in the universe. Um, the Big Bang happened, of course, about 14 billion years ago. We can see that this massive structure has already grown um, by about 9 billion years. And we can actually see the growth of the structure because we have seen bigger and bigger ones the closer to us today. So we're really able to probe this entire space between the emission of the cosmic microwave background to today using these high resolution CMB experiments. This is giving us a fantastic independent handle on our cosmology, on what the universe is made up of. Um, this is now just showing, um, I showed you the acoustic oscillations and the comparison to theory earlier. This is now just showing the counts of clusters we'd expect from the same sort of cosmology theory um, and green, and then the number counts we're seeing um, from our data. So you can see that there's an incredibly excellent agreement between the predictions of what the cosmology models predict and what we can measure um, with these cluster surveys using the COP data we've gleaned from the cosmic microwave background. So what's next? Um, we're really just getting started. I know even I've showed you in a real brief period about 15 years of work, years of work, um, but things have just gotten so much more sensitive and so much better over this period. This is really the power of ground-based um, experiments where you're not locked into a satellite launch scale. We can keep continually upgrading as the technology improves. So now with SBT3G um, over our 1500 square degree patch of sky, um, we get to this depth, which took Planck years to get to um, in about a week. And we're observing, of course, Planck did the whole sky, I should preface that. Um, but in this patch of sky, um, we get there in about a week and we're observing the same patch of sky every two days for six years. So we're just making exquisite maps of the cosmic microwave background in the millimeter wave sky. It takes a while to analyze these results, to turn these initial temperature measurements of the sky into cosmological constraints. Um, but I'm very excited to say that this past January, our first results were out, um, measuring those acoustic oscillations in the, the polarization data actually from the CMB. Um, this was only with half a season of observing data and it's already exceeding um, the best results out there. The, the future is incredibly bright. Uh, we're just going to keep hammering on this patch, um, keep tightening those error bars on all those points, measuring this constant cosmic symphony, um, keep finding these galaxy clusters, um, which are going to allow us to 
kind of strain things like dark energy. So really, really exciting times with the data sets we're having in hand. Um, looking beyond SBT3G, um, I wanna make a pitch for students again, um, if this sounds exciting to you, uh, because we really had this tremendous evolution in technology coupling uh, with science that's enabling all this progress. So our detector sensitivity has been really limited by uh, photon shot noise for the last 20 years. And the only way we can get better measurements is by making more detectors. So the, the scale of these focal planes and what we're putting on the sky has grown tremendously over the last two decades. Um, and it's only gonna keep getting better. So the, the next mission, uh, the next big upgrade for the CMB community um, will be things like Simon's Observatory and particularly CMB S4, um, which is gonna put yet another order of magnitude of detectors on the sky. Um, and it's a great time for people thinking about the CMB to get involved. Um, and I'm out of time, um, but I just want to say that I hope I've showed you um, how the CMB really provides a powerful data set, um, which, which we can constrain the beginning and ultimate fate of the universe. Um, telescopes um, like the Sopple telescope and satellites like Planck, we've really made exquisite maps of the millimeter wave sky, probing the relic afterglow of the Big Bang. Um, the high resolution data, particularly from ground-based experiments like SBT and ACT, um, serves as a backlight, um, allows us to use the CMB as a backlight, um, which is really enabling us to trace cosmic structure across time. So allowing us not only to view the early universe, but through gravitational lensing, like Blake Sherwin talked about a few years ago, and then the clusters I highlighted today, providing precision tests of theories of things like dark energy. And finally, the future is incredibly bright. Um, SPT3G, we're really just getting going with our results. Um, and we're really focused on building its successor, CMBS4, um, which is on its way. So please stay tuned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. Very amazing, excellent, very interesting talk. Uh, we have a few questions here. So I'm officially moderating the Q&A. And I believe you can see them, but you know, in case somebody's not looking there, I will read them out loud and then maybe you can answer. So first, uh, Luca Angelista wants to know about the possible presence of a spin within the universe. Galaxies and other components that are not just expanding, but expanding with rotation. Could you comment on that and eventually confirm on the 90s possibility and explain? Sorry, I cannot express myself any better. I'm only a big fan of astrophysics, not even close to an expert. Um, so I have to admit, I'm not as familiar um, with what uh, this vortex motion is, um, but I can say we have other probes. Um, so I've just mentioned the cosmic wave background, um, but we do have a lot of other probes of the universe at other wavelengths. So if you're interested in things like motion of galaxies, um, there's a uh, a way to do this actually with optical um, wavelengths um, using what's called spectroscopy. So you can actually measure um, the redshift um, and the relative velocity of galaxies on the sky. So we can see them moving away or towards us based on how the spectrum is distorted. Um, this is used to make very precision uh, tests of the growth of structure, um, just like clusters probe this evolution of structure growth in the universe, um, galaxies can as well. Um, and there's a technique called redshift space distortions, um, which would be very sensitive to some of these um, effects I think that Luca is mentioning. Um, I have not seen um, any constraints on this. Um, I, don't, I don't think there's any evidence for this sort of vortex, large significant evidence for this vortex motion, um, but there's actually new um, precision spectroscopy measurements such as um, being run by the, the DESI experiment a DESI collaboration, which would be able to provide a really great handle on this if there was such a, a motion. So thank you. Yeah. And then we have two questions by, I'm not sure how to pronounce the name. I'm sure. I'm sorry if Hegin, I think. Uh, one is if the drops on the graphs mean that there is something, a uh, planet or a sun or anything in front. And the other question is, why the choice of 150, 250 gigahertz? What is special about these frequencies? Ah, all right, uh, great questions. Um, so first, sorry, I, I was uh, maybe a little too short with this plot. 
Um, so these drops in the graph, um, each one of these drops um, actually represents a galaxy cluster. So each one of those drops um, corresponds to a shadow on the sky, um, which we've measured the distance to. So if you were looking at them at optical wavelengths, um, you would see a massive collection of galaxies at those locations, um, but we just see these shadows. So this is basically counting. If you count the drops, um, what you'll see is that uh, there's about 500 of them, uh, incredibly massive drops in this, in this picture. Um, and these are tracing uh, clusters that we found, that, that cosmic census of clusters um, informing us about the growth of structure in the universe. Now, the, the three frequencies we've chosen, um, they are quite special. Um, so the, um, the peak of the CMB black body um, actually occurs around 150 gigahertz. So we're nicely straddling the peak of the CMB spectrum um, with these three frequency choices. Uh, they are the three frequencies uh, we are, they are three of the frequencies we're allowed by the atmosphere. You can go a little bit higher um, with a ground-based experiment, um, but you start running into a lot of contamination. This is not only transmission, um, but this transmission will also trace noise. So the atmosphere does get quite noisy at higher frequencies. Um, so those are um, one of the reasons why we choose these three frequencies. Um, beyond the primary CMB science, um, this also gives you information about um, the different components of the CMB maps. Um, so things like radio sources, like those um, AGN, um, are much brighter at 90 gigahertz than 220 gigahertz. So by having these multiple frequency measurements, we can actually measure the spectrum and see what type of source it is. Um, dusty galaxies are the opposite. Um, they're much brighter at high frequencies than low frequencies. And finally, for the physics of the, the Sinaia Zeldovich effect of the galaxy clusters, um, that shadowing effect um, is actually a, a distortion of the cosmic wave background, which pushes uh, photons from lower frequencies to higher frequencies, um, creating a decrement of light at 95 and 150 gigahertz. And there's actually a null, a cancellation in the effect at 220. So there is no signal of clusters at 220. Um, but there is a decrement in the sky uh, at lower frequencies. So then we have a couple of people, Anonymous and uh, Janat, that want to know any surprisingly unexpected results from the observation or what is the most surprising information you found in Antarctica so far? So surprising things. Ah, surprising things. Um, so I think one of the great surprises of the SPT survey um, was actually the discovery of uh, these really bright, highly distant star-forming galaxies. So the, the most distant star-forming galaxies we see um, are actually not, the uh, they're, they're actually quite faint, um, but they've been gravitationally lensed. So their flux has been highly magnified by an effect called gravitational lensing by intervening structure along the line of sight. Um, and so we can really use this magnification effect, um, it's called strong gravitational lensing, um, to probe the properties of these intrinsically extremely very faint, very early galaxies um, in our survey data. So they're incredibly rare. Um, in about 2,500 square degrees, we only found 100 of them. Um, but they're really providing a really interesting picture of uh, the formation of galaxies in the early universe. So I think that was one of the, the big surprises um, that came out of the SC surveys, or sorry, the high resolution surveys. Um, there are other surprises um, that have come out of Antarctica. Um, you might be familiar with the, the BICEP survey, which um, just like SBT is looking for signals of inflation, the very, very early universe using the polarization of the data. I think we were all a bit disheartened to see how much galactic dust and contamination there is, um, which is making us work much harder to detect that signal. Um, but then there, there are everyday surprises. You never know when you see one of these shadows on the sky, uh, what you're gonna find. And we found some really, really um, fascinating stuff when we studied these individual clusters we're pulling out. 
um, as far as the, the astrophysical processes and things that happen in clusters. So there's just a really, a, this is sort of just the beginning of finding survey for these um, features, which we can then follow up with the other um, astronomical facilities and really learn a great deal about. And actually linking to this and uh, to the dust in the foreground, uh, Dana Alina, our colleague in the physics department, is asking what kind of galactic studies are done with the data, if you can do some study of uh, foregrounds of the CMB with that data. Ah, yes, absolutely. Um, so that's one of the things. Um, so when we picked where we were studying um, the fields with the South Pole Telescope, we particularly picked regions of low galactic dust emission um, because we were interested in the, the primary CMB and wanted to avoid the dust. Um, but of course, as we know from the bicep results and as we push much further into these maps, um, dust is inescapable. Um, you, you have to look through it. Um, this is one of the reasons why it's so critical for us to have those three frequencies with um, the SBT um, to uh, model out potential contamination from things like synchrotron, which will have a falling spectrum and particularly dust with rising spectrum. Um, and we're now just really digging in um, with the SPT3G data to understanding the polarization contributions from the dust to our data. It's incredibly faint, um, but we've reached the sensitivity um, that we can do these studies. Um, and we're looking to do them also in combination, not just with SPT, um, but also other traces of dust, like potentially galactic H2 surveys, um, but then also the higher frequency measurements from Planck. So it's it's a very, very, very important and active area investigation. And it's, it's um, definitely something we're gonna have to tackle um, to get the best inflationary constraints out with SBT 3G and CMBS4 in the future. Then Argin is asking if the ozone layer or changes in the ozone layer affect the measurements uh, fortunately, fortunately, not for us. Um, so no, no, not for us. Um, there. And um, related also to more the equipment side, how often the hardware system of the telescope fails due to the extreme weather? Zanat is asking. Ah, no, that's a great question. Um, so not it doesn't fail due to the the cold. Um, though we've had some problems where there mm -hmm. are um, that receiver cabin I pointed out. Um, on the telescope, it's heated um, and it's kept at about 40 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, quite cold, I guess about six or something Celsius um, in the, uh, the winter. Um, sometimes this heater goes out and that can um, cause some problems with the electronics, um, but the, everything else is really well cold insulated. Um, <clears throat> the only problems we've actually had are sometimes very rarely, um, the, the Antarctic Plateau, um, where the South Pole is, is actually generally a very calm site. It's not very windy, um, unlike the catabatic winds, like if you'd see March of the Penguins and things like that on the coast, which are extreme. Um, but once in a while, it can get quite windy, um, and the telescope will shake <laughs> when it's scanning. Um, and then we just don't take data. We dock the telescope. to. But that's, that's a very small fraction of the time we have those sort of wind weather um, effects. And uh, Graziano Rossi, very interesting talk. In terms of operational costs, how expensive is it to pursue space science in Antarctica? Ah, um, it is not cheap. Um, I cannot put a dollar amount um, on this because fortunately when you're awarded um, a National Science Foundation grant um, to operate in Antarctica, um, they don't charge us. <laughs> That's just assumed as part of the operating costs. But it is incredibly expensive, um, as you can imagine, because we have to haul in all this jet fuel. Uh, we have to haul in um, to just heat the heating costs alone to operate a station, uh, which is supporting human life um, when it's minus 100, um, and to power these great facilities, not only the South Pole Telescope, the BICEP experiment, the Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory. Um, all of this is, is incredibly electrically, um, consu it consumes a lot of electricity. Um, the flights, I mean, the, the way to go to the South Pole is to be a scientist or to pay $100,000 as a tourist. So I was, uh, um, more people have climbed in our, uh, the Mount Everest than have been to the South Pole. It's, it's not an easy place to get to. So the whole logistics chain is indeed quite, quite expensive. 
Um, but fortunately for, for my science, the US has a vested interest in maintaining a base in Antarctica um, and supporting this great science. So that's something the US taxpayers are, are supporting there. Thanks. Actually, that's interesting, and it's always a very important topic about you know, the, the cost of every scientific endeavor, especially in public talks. There's always these kind of questions that come up, and it's very important to stress that the benefits outweigh the cost immensely, especially if one thinks of how money is used in so many other things that are less useful. And uh, Abilka here as a question, um, maybe I will rephrase the question a little bit about the correlation between the dark matter and the measurement of electromagnetic waves. Basically, uh, how uh, observation of photons relates to the dark matter that is in between. Um, okay, so sure, I don't have, unfortunately I don't have a good picture to illustrate this effect, um, but I can use my mouse. Um, so what happens um, is that uh, the presence of mass, um, Einstein's theory of general relativity um, has been shown to show that the presence of mass um, between, for example, um, the cosmic wave background and us um, will actually distort uh, or warp the space time in between. Now light um, will follow what it sees as a straight path um, but what that will actually do is effectively curve it a little. So the photon, which came from here, if it was traveling in a straight line, would just you know go like that. But all of the the mass um, warping space time in between, all of this dark matter warping space time in between, will actually subtly deflect the path of photons. And over this sort of thirteen billion years, um, the scale of this deflection on the sky. Um, is about two arc minutes. So, so tiny, tiny, you know, two, two sixtieths of a degree um, shifts from where it originally started by all of the intervening mass. Um, and these shifts, um, which we can detect in the cosmic wave background um, through these gravitational lensing reconstruction techniques that Blake gave a talk on, um, are actually coherent on few degree scales on the sky. Um, so these, these shifts um, can be reconstructed from both the temperature and polarization data, and then you can actually trace out the, the intervening matter and compute what actually caused the shifting um, to see the invisible dark matter between us and the cosmic microwave background. Thanks. Very nice. We get to the last couple of questions. So we have uh, Jean Dos also here. Let me just uh, paraphrase a bit. Uh, he asks, um, what allows you to perform time resolved measurements back in time? And I think what he means is if by measuring the CMB, can you actually measure changes in that? Can you have time resolution in that since the CMB is coming from 400,000 years after the Big Bang? Ah, so can we have time resolution in the CMB? Um, itself, no. Um, we don't actually. And that's actually good for us um, in the sense that uh, we've been observing these same patches of sky now for decades. And yes, the, the, the emission from this very early plasma um, will, of course, have changed. Because, um, I mean, the, 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 we're looking you know, further back into the plasma. But the, the change over the time scales um, there, these are very, very large density fluctuations, um, which you can see sort of um, in this projection. Hang on, I'll go to Planck. Um, in this projection, so now you can just imagine turning that on its head instead of being, you know, horizontal, uh, perpendicular to the line of sight. Along the line of sight, these would also be incredibly large fluctuations. So that, that would translate into changes over very, very long time scales. And we just aren't sensitive to that with the, you know, the time scales we can take our observations. And um, but that actually is a plus um, in the sense that we're still battling noise. Um, so the fact that we get to continually stare at the same CMB and integrate down and reduce the noise um, allows us to really map this structure even better. And very quickly, one more question by Egin, which is probably the last question. If the SPT took part in detecting the black hole in the galaxy M87. Ah, yes. Um, 
Yes, so it was the it wasn't the the CMB cameras that did, but yes, the South Pole Telescope is part of the Event Horizon Telescope. Um, it is the furthest south baseline, um, and it's really important as a calibration source um, for uh, a, a phase calibrator in that particular measurement for EHT. Um, we actually take the CMB camera offline. There's like a pickoff mirror um, you can put into the the light path from the telescope. Um, and we have uh, run by Dan Maroney at the University of Arizona, the, the Event Horizon Telescope receiver is in the SPT um, and actually observes, um, coordinated with all the other sites around the world um, for a couple of weeks or about a week um, every season or so. Thank you very much. And then I don't know if any of our co-hosts here, I see uh, Professor Linda, Professor Smoot or anybody would like to add something uh, before we close up this very nice evening and very nice talk. Yes, Professor Smith, please go ahead. I, I don't have a question. I just wanted to make a, a comment and ask a little bit of a question. And that is, uh, first of all, thank you, Lindsay, for giving a really outstanding talk. And you spoke very clearly and you covered all the important points. And so <laughs> I'm impressed with that. And so I, I don't know how well people understand how difficult these things that, that, that Lindsay and her colleagues are doing, how difficult they are, and why they're so motivated to study this in such great detail, just because it's going to tell them the secrets of the universe. And, and you don't want to forget that. It's uh, to, to me, uh, I look at it and I am, um, uh, I have a certain feeling of fulfillment or gratification or something that the stuff, projects that we started years ago, more bright young people and capable people have come and taken over and pushed it to levels that I had only hoped that we would get to, but I figured on a much longer time scale, much more quickly. And the only uh, thing that I can say is, well, I did spend my time at the South Pole before it was cool. And <laughs> by that, I mean, before there was a, a, a nice station there, it was back when it was still the geodesic dome that, that Buckminster Fuller did. And we had a very big discussion about whether to allow there to be a dark sector because we were worried about people crossing the runway, you know, because the planes land there in the summer, in the Antarctic summer, but they don't land in the winter. And so, the people who are there wintering over, they get used to just walking out there. It's not a, it's not so safe walking out there, but you can walk right across and not have to look side to side and so on. But in the summer, there are planes landing quite regularly, and they just come and they land, and you know it's a big sort of an issue. And uh, but we also discuss things that that Lin Lindsay doesn't remember, but that that now she appreciates. One of the things that that I had to do in those old days is if you wanted to take a shower, you had to go and shovel some ice into an ice melter and quick run under the shower before it ran out. And <laughs> one of the things, because they were putting these extra power sources in there, was to put the waste heat down into the ice and maintain a pool of, of unfrozen ice in the form of water so that people could have plumbing. And those are things you don't think about until you're there living, but you know, it's it's the the one of the things that that I I I feel I had a hand in is convincing the National Science Foundation and the Polar Programs uh, that the CMB should be one of their major science goals. They used to have a, a an observatory of the sun, which they don't have anymore because you can watch the sun for months at a time without missing anything. So when so you're looking at solar cycle, you, you can count the sunspots. You can do all these things. Right, and they cut the ramp, the funding down on the solar stuff, and they ramped it up on the cosmic microwave background, and that's one of the reasons that Lindsay's stuff gets exported. And the question came up about how expensive it is. It is expensive to be there, not as expensive as being in space, but it's still expensive to be there. It's an intermediate scale, you know. Flying, the the higher you get away from the Earth, you know, flying in balloons is even more expensive. But flying in space is the most expensive. And so, but it, it's definitely expensive, but it, I think it's definitely 
a training ground for people and instrumentation to be able to make these really incredible measurements. And I, I have to say, I, I, I think that all the people in the field should be very proud of how much progress they've made and hopefully will make uh, during the next stage during CNDS4. So that was just, you know, attaboys. <laughs> So thank you, thank you very much, Professor Smoot, and thank you very much, uh, Lindsay, for uh, the beautiful talk. And if there's no more comments, I think we can uh, close the evening here and wish you all the best and good luck for the future of this amazing research. Thank you. Thank you. It was great to be here today.